Hey everyone, happiest days to you. My name is Rob Case, paddling technique coach, and you're listening to the Drop It In Surf Show, a show blending science and math with surfing to the best of our ability. On today's episode, I grab Zuhair Belkora once again to extend our conversation about surfing and science and research with Dr. Jeff Nessler and Dr. Sean Newcomer professors at Cal State San Marcos. Jeff and Sean are making huge contributions to surfing through their scientific studies on wetsuits, on surfboard design, on fitness, on paddling, you name it. I had the privilege to meet Jeff and Sean back in 2015, 2016, and was immediately fascinated with the science they were conducting. I truly believe that they're at the beginning of something great that will impact surfing for a very long time. So please enjoy my conversation with Jeff and Sean, and welcome back, Zuhair. We're doing a skateboard study just off campus because it's a little bit easier to get that approved, a little easier to work with people. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What, like, is it a surf skate or just straight skateboarding? Um, it's mostly just, uh, we're looking at how much the average person is getting a workout at skate park. Uh -huh. So we did this for a while, just looking at, um, kids and we saw that the kids were like super active, right? It's like one of the best forms of exercise there is. Yeah. And we saw the same thing with surf PE too. Like their heart rates were through the roof for an hour, um, but then we wanted to look at adults and we saw the same thing in adult skaters, you know, just like recreational skateboarders, not pro skaters, yeah. super high heart rates sustained over, you know, an hour on average, which is a pretty good workout. Yeah. And so now um, we're, we're doing this study for the skate park project, which is kind of a, an offshoot of the Tony Hawk foundation. And their whole mission is to, promote and help to facilitate skate parks getting built in different cities. Wow, that's a genius. And so if we can provide data that shows it's super good exercise, mm -hmm. then that, that helps them kind of advocate for more skate park funding. Yeah, that's rad. And so right now we're doing the same study, but we're looking at people who aren't skateboarding, but riding other stuff at the skate park to see how that compares. So BMX, scooters, inline skates, looking for some wheelchair people. I haven't, I haven't found any wheelchair users yet. Yeah. I'm surprised there's still inline skaters out there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> there's, but you know, what's funny is there are certain parks, like if you want scooters, there's like one park you go to and there's like a ton of scooters there. And like, if you want inline skaters, there's like another park where they mm -hmm. hang out. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I was just talking to Zuhair about we're, we're prepping for a surf ranch trip, trip, uh, coaching okay. trip that we're taking. And, uh, I have been surf skating and dude, I get the best workout surf skating. I get so tired within about 20 minutes. And then it's that last 10 minutes where I'm like, oh, I'll just do a couple more runs. That's when I get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old man curse, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've been cutting out that last 10 minutes just to make sure I don't get hurt. Yeah. We, we did our first study with kids because Sean was having these parents come up to him and say, I need your help. My kid's not active after school. He just comes home and then he goes to the skate park and, you know, he's not exercising. And Sean's like, what are you talking about? He's probably getting like the best exercise possible there. So yeah. that, that was kind of where the, the idea started. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. I would even say that it helps their determination. You ever seen a skateboarder try to try to get a new trick down? Yeah. Yeah. They just keep going, they keep going, <laughs> keep going. I know. And they take the worst falls and they just yep. keep going. One of the studies we want to do is if you sit there and watch some of these kids, they will drop off of like a six foot ledge, like over and over again onto their board. And we're just sitting there going, that, that can't be good for you to do it like 20 times. <laughs> right. But we want to know like, what is, what kind of forces are they experiencing? And like, is that 
impacting bone density and, and other, you know, other factors. But yeah, no, I totally get what you're saying. They just do the same thing over and over again. How are you doing instrumentation for that kind of stuff, especially with kids? Like when you say do, do all the kids there wear heart rate monitors all of a sudden, or how does that all work? We, so we bring heart rate monitors and, and we help set them up with heart rate monitors. We have some other sensors. We haven't used that much. Um, the heart rate monitors actually have GPS in them. So we can track like how, how far they go. We can get like elevation and stuff. So we can see if they're Right. riding bull or if they're doing street. Um, but we also, we bought these insoles. They're like force measuring insoles. And we started using those a little bit, but they're super uncomfortable and the kids hate them. Right. <laughs> and they're not all that accurate. So I'm not, I'm, I'm actually kind of disappointed in them. I thought they were going to be awesome. And we actually tried to waterproof them and put them, put them in some surf booties to see if we could get like forces on surfers. And we were able to get one session, but I don't think the forces are that accurate. We tried validating them in the lab and they're just not, not great. Right. Yeah. I saw you guys did, did, uh, Sean sent me a study about you guys going to the surf park and doing some, what was that study all about? The, the one that you did at the surf park. Question. Yeah, so the main the 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 one that we the major study that got published out of that was looking at the heart rate response while riding a wave. Um, and it was a really unique situation, right? Because the wave is exactly the same every single time, um, which is great. And they can ride that wave front side and back side, which is also fantastic. So it was an opportunity that we had um, working with Hurley. They had their development team that they had rented out the surf ranch for for two two days and we got the consent of the parents of the children to participate as subjects in this study. So in, in, a, in a fields type of study, right? When somebody's riding a wave, it's, it's pretty rare for you to get a wave that lasts one minute in duration, right? So, so this is unique. And, and during that first competition, I think I heard, heard some anecdotal people saying some things, some of the competitors saying some things or hearing from somebody else that competitors had said that, this was unlike any kind of competition they ever had because they don't typically ride waves for one minute long. So it kind of brought up an interesting paradigm. Are, should these, these athletes be trained for these type of competitions where they have these long rides very differently than a, a normal competition? So we wanted to look at what the, what the cardiovascular response was of these, of these individuals when they're riding one minute wave because in the field, we get maybe a five second, 10 second clip maybe 15 seconds if we're lucky and we don't get much information or resolution and the waves are never the same either. So what we did is we did a very simple study in which we measured the heart rate response of the subjects while they were, were riding these waves and a variety of subjects. So I can't remember the exact number. I'd have to go back to the, the manuscript itself. And we, we measured it going front side and back side. What we wanted to do, and we also were filming at the same time, what we wanted to do is also kind of correlate that to what they were doing on the wave, which became a little bit more challenging uh, than, than we had thought. So we just basically um, provided that information about heart rate in general. And, and we saw is these athletes are working at really, really high levels during their wave riding experience. And by the end of the wave, they're at very, very high levels of, of cardiovascular, um, their cardiovascular system is being taxed at very high levels. So um, that's what kind of came out of that. And um, so I was the same. We did a couple other things that didn't work out there. We looked at uh, <laughs> uh, tissue motion in the in, in the breast tissue motion of female surfers um, wearing different types of of swimsuits to see if that had an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get very good data on that, if I remember correctly. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, I don't think any of that. Yeah. Turned out. And then we also tried to measure uh, movement characteristics of of people while they were surfing and that was kind of a, just on one or two people and that was really challenging too yeah now did the surfers have to make the whole wave um yeah we we they didn't have to but we we parsed the data up so that if they didn't we could we could kind of tease that out and um, but yeah and if they made the whole wave that was that was better yeah yeah were you familiar with the um there was a study done a while back i think it might have been oliver farley's study um where they did it in new zealand 
Are you familiar with that one where they put heart rate monitors on competitors in a competition? Yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar. But that wasn't as much on, on the actual wave riding because, I mean, there was some wave riding in there, right? But it was such a, sh a short duration that they didn't get really, really good data from that. Um, but yeah, they did, they did show that the responses during the competition itself, the paddling and, and maneuvering during that, that those competitions, once again, we're at a high, pretty high level for those yeah. subjects. And, and what I took from that, because until you guys sent me this one, um, was the highest heart rate happens when you kick out of a wave for the most part. So yours is kind yeah, of- Yeah, it's, it's, it's correlated to the very end, right? So that's, the end. They're, they're probably super fatigued by the very end and that's when they're, they're, they're leaving or exiting the wave. Yeah. And it's so funny you mentioned that because I've, I've discussed this with clients and I'm like, listen, when you kick out of a wave, you got to like take a moment because your heart rate's super high. They always think their highest heart rates when they're paddling into the wave or when they're on the way out. I'm like, no, like look at some of this data. And this, the study you sent me really backs it up, which is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, so, some of these kids, uh, we, their heart rates were getting to age predicted maximum heart rates by the end of the wave. So they're at a hundred percent of effort at that end of the wave. So that's pretty phenomenal. And, to, and like I said, it, it does bring up this theoretical kind of question. If you're going to have future competitions in wave pools that are similar to that one, that have long durations, not like the Waco wave point, but a long duration type of point break type of style wave pool, does the training of the athlete have to change yeah. um, for that? Well, it's similar to swimming, right? You have... 50 meters versus 1500 meters, totally different ways to train. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. When you look at the, when you look at the um, sort of exertion profile that you saw in that wave, what's this, what's a sport that has a similar sort of, sort of uh, intensity profile where you have a minute of intense work, you know, starting at a high level and going to max. And how does that training regimen compare to what surfers usually do? Yeah. I mean, I, it would it would be anything that was would be very very high intensity. So you know, thinking of somebody trying to run 400 meters um, would be something similar to that. A very very high level of intensity for a long duration over one minute is really hard to maintain. If it's a run 400 meter dash or 400 meter race, knows it's very hard to maintain that type of intensity for a long period of time. Um, so yeah, it's it's. It's, it's an anaerobic type of exercise in the sense that using anaerobic energy sources to, to basically do those movements. And so any type of anaerobic exercise that had sustain, a sustained component to it. So it's not like a, a five second sprint, something that is anaerobic and sustained for longer durations would be what you would want the athlete to do to try to mimic that type of, you know, that type of situation. I think it's too late for you to start on it, Zuhair, before our trip. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. We're, go we're going in like you're not, two weeks. You're not giving us like a full minute, are you? No, no. You're not giving you a full minute on the wave? No, we're doing split waves. We're, we're okay. splitting it up because, you know, once again, people don't last uh, and they get more reps. But yeah, especially if, I mean, we were looking at very high-end surfers, right? These, these developmental, this development team, these kids were surfing about a really, really high level. And they, and they were very fit too. Yeah. And they were even gassing it then you can tell. So it was like, it's, it's not worth it for them to ride that full 60 seconds. Yeah. I mean, 30 seconds, is pretty darn good. <laughs> compared yeah, yeah, to what no, we get. I mean, yeah. Yeah. If you're on a 15 sec second wave, you still feel it at the end of 15 seconds. Yeah. At least at my age, you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, what other projects are you guys working on that you're excited about? Maybe Jeff, you got any exciting ones that you're working on? Um, that have to do with uh, surfing. Come on. <laughs> yeah, we sort of cleared the deck, I think, over the last two years being at home. Yeah. So I think we're just now putting together projects. Um, yeah, we're having, I, I don't know, I, I, we're having some discussions. We have some people out in the field looking at, um, wetsuit differences, differences in wetsuit material. Um, one study looking at, well, actually two studies looking at uh, the effect of graphene and whether that's actually warmer. That's, that's still more Sean's area. In, in my area, looking at biomechanics, um, we're thinking about doing kind of a sprint paddling analysis on our 
<clears throat> on our ergometer. <laughs> no, 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 no. And uh, no, using no, no. motion capture and forces and, you know, trying to look at um, something that would be comparable to like a wind gate analysis. I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, mm -hmm. where it's like a, it's analysis of power and looking at aerobic power and how much it declines or, or how rapidly it declines over a 30 second period. And uh, we do that. It's, it's pretty common to do that in lower extremity in athletes. Um, not, not that common to, to do an upper extremity test. And so we want to, we want to look at surfers and compare surfers to non surfers to see kind of what that, that power output looks like. Cool. I got excited because like one of my goals, uh, one of my interests right now is, is measuring acceleration uh, over a defined moment of time and distance, um, both in flat water first in flat water. And then also when getting into a wave, because um, mm -hmm. it, it relates to what I teach in my level two course, which is all about catching waves and how yeah, it should be more of a focus on acceleration. But um well, that's, that's neat. It, you know, coincidentally, when Zuhair and I recorded our last podcast, um, one of your researchers, one of Sean's researchers uh, was asking us questions about the wetsuit. So that was, Who's that? oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's, yeah, that's, a, that's, so right now we're kind of, Jeff and I are kind of wrapping up some, some stuff up more, not biomechanically driven, but more thermoregulation physiologically driven so that was one of those studies um so we have three studies wrapping the first one jeff just mentioned is one of his graduate students uh looking at graphene and and fleece uh, linings within wetsuits there's these fleece lines that are using graphene now and uh, many 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 people in the industry believe this is a far superior uh type of material for warmth and so we're, we've just finished that study off um and then we were looking at an, another another material, uh, a slick smoothie type of material that was typically used on the outside of wetsuits, obviously. And then this synthetic type of, of material that kind of mimics some of the properties of smoothie because smoothie um, material is, is really fragile and not very durable. And it, uh, you get nail cuts and it rips very easily and everything. That's why um, the industry doesn't use it all that often in, in high wear um, areas. And we're looking if we we've shown very nicely in a, a, a set of studies that 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 smoothing material is actually warmer than um, um, neoprene that has nylon outer linings. Um, so if you can basically mimic the properties of the slick or smoothing material with something that is more durable, that would be highly advantageous uh, for which let's you manufacture. So we're finishing that study off right now too. And then the study you spoke about, which is really uh, a big study. Um, I think we're at close to a thousand subjects now. It sounds like you were one of the subjects. Two of them, um, yeah. Was we had done a tremendous amount of data characterizing where heat is lost across the body um, during both surf sessions in the field and then also in, in, our, in our flume in a more controlled environment. And we've done a really nice job characterizing that in both men and women and has provided a lot of insight in how wetsuits should be manufactured, at least where the distribution of, of neoprene should be um, in wetsuits. The problem with this is that scientifically that's great and we can show that this region gets colder and this is where people are losing the most heat and therefore we need to insulate that area the most. And we've made some, some very strong arguments for why wetsuits should be changed in, in certain ways in, in our articles. But it really comes back to consumer at the end of the day. Where does the consumer feel like they're losing the most heat? Because if, if the data doesn't, if our scientific data on skin temperatures and heat loss doesn't match their perceptual data, it's not going to do anything for the consumer to buy something that they don't perceive as actually keeping them warmer. So the study you were, you were talking about is we've sent a, a number of, it's McKinsey's master's thesis, but she had a number of undergraduates helping her on this. And we would send them out to the field and the surfers got out of the water. As soon as they're getting out of the water, they're asking them a series of questions about uh, uh, perception of heat loss across the body and also wetness across the body after a search session. And you probably think to yourself, well, why didn't you just do this through a, a website like Surfline or something like that? The problem is the perception could change, right? After an hour or two hours after the water, it's like, oh, I'm always cold here. 
But in reality, when you get out of the water, there really may be a re region you're always cold, but you don't actually perceive it that in the region. So that's where we get them when they're coming right out of the water. So we have uh, the data, you know, instantaneously. So we're really excited about that because that's really going to allow us to line the scientific heat loss data, skin temperatures up with perceptual data. And for surf industry, which isn't us, but for wetsuit manufacturers, that should provide a tremendous amount of information on how to build a wetsuit better, which ironically, nobody has actually done that data or that, mm -hmm. those studies in 50 years, which is surprising to me. Mm -hmm. I am really surprised that nobody's picked up on it because I, I, I did browse your site a while back and that's how I found the study that relates to the one that you know, Rob and I did, but I looked at the wetsuit stuff. I was thinking, well, if I'm losing heat everywhere, why do I wear a four three? Why aren't, why am I not wearing a four mil everywhere? Right. Um, yeah. Seems to me that it's the smaller ones, specialized ones up here in NorCal who, who might be motivated to look at stuff like that. Cause we have so many like small companies up here that probably would be more flexible in thinking about stuff like that than the big ones. Right. Yeah, the, the the problem is usually that that they don't don't have the resources to do that type of thing, right? So the bigger companies have more resources to invest in that type of R and D, um, and the smaller ones don't. But the great thing about what we're doing is it's all public information, it's all public access, right? As long as we're not getting direct funding from somebody who says you need to make sure there's proprietary information, you can't. As long as you're not getting that. Um, which we haven't, and we have in the past in other studies, which we have not published and I can't speak about, but in the studies that we do publish, that's open for all wetsuit industry to look at. And I, it, like I said, I just, I just kind of giggle to myself. I'm like, no, why they're not tapping into all this, um, but they're just not, unfortunately. That was actually going to be one of my questions. Cause I know, I think we can all agree on the importance of, of science driving, coaching and driving board manufacturing and driving wetsuit manufacturing design. I was going to ask if you guys have seen any change um, in the industry, whether science and research is happening more at the earlier stages of design, whereas right now it's kind of like post-design, how does it look, right? So it should be the other way, right? It should be science first and then design. Are you guys seeing any of that yet? I don't know that we're seeing much outside of wetsuit design. Like I think we started to see some of that with um, Hurley with some of our work. Um, but since Nike sold Hurley, I don't, you know, we haven't been in communication with them. So I don't know what they're doing with the data that, that we generated. And so I, I mean, Sean can talk a little bit more about how, um, they had designed a wetsuit based on our data. And I'm not sure if it ever came out. It, it did. did. Okay. Yeah. It did. So we, we did have one, <laughs> one claim to fame, I guess, or one, one application there, but uh, I don't see much changing outside of wetsuit design necessarily yet. Yeah. yeah. And that was just, that was just one group to tell you the yeah. truth. It was, and that, that group no longer exists. They're, they're a different company. Uh, or forming a different company currently. But yeah, I mean, the way it had worked initially when we got involved with material testing, testing equipment and materials was the company would come to us and say, theoretically, we think this is going to work. Uh, we have anecdotal evidence or we had wear testing from the professionals that said it worked. Can you, can you validate that for us? And I, Jeff and I could look at it and we, we would look at the you know, the physics behind it or the physiology or whatever it was. And, and you know, with, within one or two subjects, I could tell you if it was working or not pretty easily. Um, and it was quite frustrating, right, to be on the end of that. Right. Um, because you, you could see all the flaws in their thinking when they're coming to you and you don't want to say you, you missed, like, there's 10 gaps that you missed there. Um, so luckily enough, we had we had spoken to some people in, in, in the material and testing industry and other other groups that basically told us you need to get on the front end of this. And so when we were working with, with Hurley and specifically Bruce Moore, um, who was the head of innovation for Hurley at the time, um, he allowed us to do that. He allowed us to get in front of us and said, what do you guys think? And what experience do you think you should do that would help us as, as wetsuit manufacturers? And that's when it kind of blew up and that's when we got really involved. And, and that's really the set of studies, not set of studies, but our thinking has kind of come to right now at the very end of these settings, I think we've probably done 10 or 12 studies on wetsuits and 
we're kind of ending it off of all of our thinking of, of how to make wetsuits better. Um, but yeah, in general, it just seems like this industry is very resistant to any kind of information that would, would go against what the, the current paradigm of their thoughts are. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's the people in the industry. I don't know what, what, what's going on with it, but it's just, it's very different than the footwear industry or the athletic apparel industry where, you know, any piece of scientific information they can get that'll put their product a little bit ahead of another product they're going after. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it's, it's at least for us, we don't have people banging down our doors to get information about the product they're building, which is just striking because right every year, so just think about wetsuits in general or surfboards every year, there's a new wetsuit, new, better wetsuit that every, and every company has a new, better wetsuit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they never provide you any data showing it's better. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting that they never, they never ask us to, to validate that it's better, ask anybody to validate that it's better. So. Yeah. I always say that uh, my wetsuit feels warmer because it's new. <laughs> that was always and, my adage. And you're probably right because, you know, we, we provide some data showing that if you can make those closures tighter, that you're going to have decreased heat loss. And so as the wetsuit ages, you decrease its elasticity. Those entry points start breaking down more water's flushing in and out. It's going to get colder. Yeah. Um, so the better it fits, the tighter it fits without having an impact on range of motion, the warmer you're probably going to be. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting that what you're, what you're saying, I mean, it's, it's probably the easiest way to be scientific about, you know, equipment in surfing is the wetsuit, right? Oh, yeah. Cause like with boards, boards are like notoriously suboptimal, right? Unlike let's say a sailboat, because you know, that that's actually floating, right? Uh, surfboards mm -hmm. are made to turn and to be unstable for fun, but wetsuits, come on, like you can, you can measure this stuff and you would, you would imagine somebody would be science led, but it's really yeah. interesting that it's not the case. Yeah, it's, it, it's a really good point. I, I, like I said, I really struggle with it every day. <laughs> and in the last couple of years, I've struggled with it a lot, thinking this information's all out there. Why aren't people using this information? Why aren't they asking us to help them to, to create a better wetsuit? And, you know, in one of our first papers we, we published, we talk about the importance of thermoregulation in surfing and how it can impact performance significantly and how you know, only modest changes in, in, in skeletal muscle changes, uh, skeletal muscle uh, temperature can have significant impacts on performance and force output and things such as that. And if you could raise that temperature by a degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius, it would have phenomenal impacts. We, we've all been there right after a long session and maybe not even paddling that much, a, a long session where there wasn't a lot of waves coming through. And we go to stand up on our last wave and our, our legs feel like lead. They don't feel like they're moving at all. And that's because of, of the, the cold and the impact it's having on muscle. And I always say, if you want to make a surfer perform better, make sure they're warm. Make sure they're warm. I, I, can, I can get a better increase in performance from making sure a surfer is warm in a cold environment than any training regimen could ever have on a surfer, ever. Um, on a, on a high-end surfer, not a, not a surfer, obviously, that is novice and, and training is obviously going to have a big impact, right? But a high-end surfer where 1% change in in, 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 their, in their function or, or the performance is significant. That's what wins a, a heat. Well, get them warm and I dare, I, I can get you more than 1% increase if I can keep them warm. Yeah. Well, maybe now's the time. You need to call Kelly Slater and say, look, you're 50, right? I have a wetsuit for you. That's gonna make you hit, win all the cold water contests. And then the world is gonna blow up. Cause that, yeah, that's how you sell wetsuits, right? It's Unfortunately, I'm not a wetsuit manufacturer or designer, so I just have the theory. I don't actually have the wetsuit. <laughs> if I did, I would be making a lot more money than I make now, probably. I think. So, I mean, yeah. I think we're. I think the time is is right for this to start to take off with the Olympics now being, you know, surfing being in the Olympics and having it be more serious, like a sport, like a an actual athletic of, of, of event in an Olympics. I'm I'm thinking it's the next decade, you know, just be, just be patient and keep cracking away. <laughs> well, it's good. We'll be the people that will look back on when we retire and say, Oh, those guys were ahead of their time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's so cool. Um, I know I agree with you this and Jeff has also agreed in this, like for, for both skate and surf, 
this is the time where these alternative sports or action sports or whatever you want to call them are changing. And it's changing from our generation that, that didn't see them quite as much as sport as more as, as leisure or fun or, 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 or just lifestyle, right? To now you have the next generation or I shouldn't say next generation because next generation is like 30 year olds, right? And I'm not even close to that. So, <laughs> you know, teenagers that are seeing this now as, as a sport, they're working with, they're working with trainers. They're working with people for their paddling. They're working with, with designers on their boards and wetsuits and everything else. They're working with nutritionists. They're really seeing this as a sport and they're investing a lot of time to increase their, their abilities in, within the sport because I do, I do think it's becoming more um, mainstream yeah. for the general population and, and perceived as a sport, even in, within our population. I know there's I know there's older people that are, are curmudgeon and they don't want it to be seen as a sport and that's how it is. Um, but they're going to die off someday and these younger kids are taking over. And so it's, that's how it's going to be. It's, it's going to be a sport someday. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I th in my past life, I did a lot of process improvement with corporations and you know, you're at a stage, an advanced stage when your supply chain, and in this case, I'm, I'm relating it to science, scientific research is at the front end of design versus the back end. And so mm -hmm. it does happen. It goes through this evolution. So we use that same kind of metaphor, then it just takes time and just keep cracking away at it. And, and some of the studies, one of the recent studies actually you sent me was <clears throat> that, that I especially liked um, the electromyographic analysis of paddling. Um, Jeff, was that your your kind of study there? Yeah, I, I did most of the analysis for that and, and most of the writing. Sean was involved in kind of the design. It was actually a two-part study. So there was another paper that was published as uh, kind of part one to that. So the participants did both studies. And so we were comparing um, energy use on in the flume versus on the ergometer doing that VO2 max test. Yeah. And, uh, well, and that one too also um, had the the different muscle groups that were being activated, mm -hmm. right? And and that one I really enjoyed uh, seeing at different speeds in the flume, mm -hmm. um, seeing some of the stuff that I that I get out of my force sensors. It was pretty closely related to what you were showing mm -hmm. with the EMG, which is awesome to see. I'd be curious about where the different muscle groups get engaged in the stroke on different boards now. Cause I've actually seen a difference, at least from my perspective of my sensors, those were all on the same size board, right? Same size board, but at different speeds, speeds different right. paddling yep. intensities. So and I would be, so, I'd be curious about different size boards and different volume boards Yeah. as an extension to that. And then did you do that with wetsuits um, with, with or without a wetsuit? Have you tried that one? Not, not in the swim flume, but we've done it on the ergometer okay. in the lab. And we actually, um, so we have a paper right now that I'm hoping is, we're about to resubmit the revised version, looking at uh, paddling in a wetsuit versus a no wetsuit. Um, we actually had two different kinds of wetsuits, one with um, neoprene and one with uh, where the foam was uh, thermoplastic elastomer. Um, which is kind of a, I mean, we're looking at alternatives to neoprene to make wetsuits uh, a little bit more maybe sustainable. So using something other than neoprene, which is not easily recyclable. And so we wanted to see uh, how this new material compares. And so we did look at muscle activation, both with and without a wetsuit and between the two different kinds of wetsuits. And this was kind of a repeat of a study we did in 2016, which was um, kind of the same idea, but in that case, we just used jackets, wetsuit jackets in, in the uh, lab. So we, we basically don't see a whole lot of difference between paddling with and without a wetsuit. We see a few muscles that change their activation patterns, in particular, the middle deltoid, which is kind of the, the big muscle here that is active with return. And so that kind of makes sense. If the wetsuit provides resistance to lifting your arm out of the water, you'd see a little more muscle activation. <clears throat> in the, the study of the flume, 
where participants were paddling faster and faster, we actually did start to see a change in the activation pattern of the deltoid where it wasn't just active for returning the, the hand, but it actually became more active in propulsion. And so it, it wasn't much of a, um, it wasn't very active during the propulsion phase until we crossed some threshold of intensity. And then we saw more, more activation there. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of compare it to something known as the duty cycle, right? If you think of the stroke as a kind of a repeating cycle, uh, the muscles are active for a particular percentage of that, that cycle. And so the duty cycle of the deltoid increased significantly, both in duration and intensity as people paddled faster. And it wasn't a linear increase too. It kind of had a, almost like a, I guess more of a logarithmic increase over time. Yeah, yeah. super interesting. We all, yeah, we also did something which I, I may have sent you that paper. It just got submitted for publication. It's under review right now. Uh, we did look at um, force production with varying thicknesses of wetsuits. Um, so going from no wetsuit to only six, six millimeters mm -hmm. of wetsuit, because we, our theory was that the thicker the wet, and this is just sprint paneling. Our theory was with the thicker the wetsuit, the reduction, there would, there would be a correlation with a reduction in, um, uh, in force production. And we didn't actually see that. We were a little surprised that we didn't see that. But then it, you had EMGs on that too, right, Jeff? Yes, we did. I'm not sure if we published the EMG data though, or if it's included. Yeah, we may not have published. I that was remember. in the flume or on the ERG? It was on our ergometer. Okay. Uh, but we were then we were doing it in the flume when COVID hit and we actually had to pull back and we couldn't we couldn't collect that data and sprint paddling. But the interesting thing is that yeah, we didn't see that. In fact, there was actually between you know not wearing a wetsuit all the way to six millimeters. There was actually, it, it, it wasn't significant, but there seemed to be like a sweet point between, I think it was three and four millimeters where they, there was actually almost a bump and in increase in the force that we were generating, that they were generating. Once again, it wasn't significant. So we don't want to talk about it from a scientific perspective, but it did start making us think that maybe the, the neoprene as we were, as they were, you know, basically stretching their arm out and loading that neoprene was acting as a spring and recoiling as they were pulling. And at a certain thickness, that was it was optimal, but it was got too thick. It, it was no longer optimal for, to make that, that type of spring mechanism. So that was something that we saw from that. Another thing that we saw was um, it's it was it was strokes three and four. They had they did about between one to eight strokes. And strokes three and four, they were able to generate the greatest amount of forces significantly compared to all the other strokes. So that's something that you probably may yeah. know about with the studies and the research you do. And then it degraded um, after that. Yeah. Then it degraded. Yeah. So it kind of, it kind of did this and then, and then it backed down. off. Yeah. Yeah. That's similar actually a lot of the swim studies that I've been seeing too, but you know how wonderful this is though. This is what I love about what you guys do is that it always asks more questions, more questions come out of it. And that, that other study that I was referring to earlier, Jeff was, we talked about it over email was you noticed a difference in yawing and the efficiency. So the yawing or the, or the moving of the nose back and forth and the efficiency or the VO2 output. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That was a study looking at um, volume distribution in the board. <clears throat> and oh, different one, huh? okay. part of that analysis, we wanted to see if we could use just a simple IMU on the nose of the board. So a sensor that measures acceleration and we can use it as a tilt sensor. And so we wanted to see if we could measure board angle and roll and yaw with just that one sensor on the nose of the board and instead of having to use cameras to figure out what the board's doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it turned out it worked really well. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think I'm, I actually may have gotten this idea from you where you mentioned uh, you, you saw more yaw motion in more novice paddlers. And so I thought, well, I wonder if there's a, a correlation between energy use and how much the board's moving in that direction. Uh, and so we use the accelerometer to, to just tell us how much the nose is moving side to side. And it turns out it, it did have a, a significant correlation. Yeah. So, so yeah, rather than measuring VO2, maybe you could use that as kind of like a proxy measure. Yeah. Too. I like that. I'm going to get one of those IMUs. <laughs> 
Yeah, they're not they're not too expensive. I'm a Walmart now, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But you can get like roll angle and you get pitch angle. I love that. Yeah, yeah there there are parts of what I teach that I know the results from the swimming studies, but I I don't have the numbers that you guys have, and that's what I loved about the one that we used in our last experiment that you guys have done. You did pitch pitch and roll and the correlation that you saw with volume goes well in line with what I teach and it supported that. And, but I've, I'm always like, yeah, you need a slight roll depending on volume and length and width, but I, I don't know to what degree, you know, I don't know what those benchmarks are. Um, and same, same with, same with pitch. There's no benchmarks. We just have some generalizations on what is going to reduce drag. Um, based on what we know about from swimming. So this is, this is all great for me. Keep coming. <laughs> um, Zuhair, do you think any of these studies help your friends determine what board you can make them? <laughs> well, I don't know if uh, Rob shared sort of our little write-up with you guys of what we try to do. Um, but I mean, the, the bottom line is, yeah, we did a study and then the people still want the board that they think they want, not really what, what, what it should do, right? I mean, it, this all got inspired because somebody asked me to make a board that paddles well and dives well. And it, I thought, okay, eight foot board, that's super thin, you can dive it, it's gonna paddle great. And he was like, no, I want a thick fish, which you know, is, is, <laughs> is, is yeah. the exact opposite, right? But, um, <laughs> yeah. at, least, at least we did, we did an experiment and now I know it's right. right. Length matters more for efficiency. But uh, yeah, are you going to push back the next time though? You're going to be like, boom, here's Jeff and Sean's study on wetsuits. Boom. Here's this on, on boards. Yeah. Are I'm you... going to push back. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm making a board for, right. She yeah. wants one that turns and we, she ended up saying, no, I don't want a mini glider. Like, that's not what, but okay. <laughs> if, that, if that's, if that's what you want me to make. You don't make that. Yeah. So I, so here, I think, I think it'd be interesting that study that, that uh, Rob is kind of, talking about where in our first study we had the same size board but we changed the volume right right and, and that really came that was that was a simple study that you know volume matters and, and you know the average person said, yeah they're, they're, or, or more volume is going to have more buoyancy easier paddle right and it's going to be right. relatively linear to some extent and then as soon as you get to some some level or some volume it's going to flatten out that curve's going to flatten right out. yeah so the next question really came from conversations I'd have with our, my shaper and, and what I heard on the internet from shapers is like, well, it's the distribution of volume that's important. How you distribute it through that, that board that becomes so important. And, and really to, to have the greatest amount of paddling um, efficiency, you need to distribute the greatest amount of thickness in the chest area and this and that, right? And I, I was hearing all this and distribute, it all, it was just a couple of years ago, distribution volume, distribution volume, you know? And I, I'm not taking anything away, anything away from the shapers because shapers are amazing. They're, they're some of the most masterful people I've ever met in my life. The fact that I can take a piece of foam and I can have a tremendous time on it every, and, and I can ask them what to do something. Like, I want the board to do this. I don't give them anything other than that. This is what I want the board to do. And they come out with it and it works. It's just amazing to me. But I did want to get some scientific, scientific data on that. And that's when we worked with uh, Firewire to basically make the same board same volume, but distribute it vastly differently. So either distribute it mostly the nose or the tail or, or the normal shape. And it, it came back, it, like if we look at paddling efficiency, it came back, it didn't matter where you distributed that foam. It didn't have to be under the chest. It was exactly yeah. the same um, for paddling efficiency. So, but yet I was just listening to something on Surfline. And I, I don't know what shape it was. I wouldn't even be, mention his name if I did know it, to tell you the truth, but they were pushing Volume has to be under the chest if you want paddling to be better. Um, so what are your thoughts on that as a shaper? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering academic, right? I, so my background is different from most shapers, right? Uh, so I don't have an opinion if it's not tested. And so one of the things that I think people are conflating, maybe, Rob, you can comment on this, is that there's three stages to paddling, right? There's paddling out, which is sort of flat water paddling and a little bit of diving. Uh, and then there's paddling sort of for position. And then there's paddling to catch the wave. And I think where the volume is on the board might matter for the latter two, but we can't really test that in a flume or we can't really test that 
I don't know how you would test it in the field. Maybe you guys have ideas about that, but you know, I, I don't think, because if you show in the flume, it doesn't matter for paddling efficiency, then it just doesn't matter full stop, right? And similarly, I want to say the study we did, Rob and I, it's like, we could demonstrate that you need fewer strokes per minute at the same speed with a longer board. Well, that sort of settles it, right? That, that, that's how I think about it, right? And then, you know, all the, all the other things that a shaper will do to make a board work this way or the other way, those are all the places where it's incredibly difficult to be scientific about it, in my opinion, because, you know, we don't have the... We don't have Kelly Slater's wave pool at our disposal to re reproduce the same wave with different boards, with instrumentation. It's going to be quite difficult to, to get there. Yeah, maybe we'll no, I, right? I, I agree with you 100%. That's, that's why we, we stuck to paddling, because it was super easy. Right. The variable <laughs> was very simple. The, there were very few variables we had to worry about, and that's, that's why we stuck to that. And, and also, like you said, Sprint paddling versus just transit paddling is totally two different things. The majority of time is spent transit paddling. So if you're looking at energy spent during a surf session, then then we would we would argue that if that's why you're shaping a board to have volume to, to decrease energy expenditure um, in certain regions, it's probably not if putting that volume in the chest probably isn't having an impact. No, um, it's probably so, not. But, but you're right, maybe sprint paddling and getting into the wave may, ch may change significantly. Yeah. One, one question that we had when, when we were discussing this study. So we found, uh, we found one where you had just a strict increase of thickness, right? And, and you found that the effort in heart rate and VO2 was decreasing as the volume was increasing, right? But the number of strokes, the cadence stayed constant. And as Rob and I were discussing this sort of from a macro energy expenditure point of view, I would venture a guess that cadence would be the high order component that, that has energy expenditure overall. Uh, would you agree with that? You know, you guys being kinesiologists and us just being amateurs. Yeah, I, I guess the, uh, the one criticism I would have of you guys' in study is looking at cadence probably isn't the best measure of efficiency. Um, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not a very robust measure for that way, because you can generate more different forces with the same ca cadence, and really, and, and heart rate is also a good measure, but it's not the best measure. The only right. way to really look at this is looking at the amount of oxygen that's been consumed and how much oxygen is being utilized by that mitochondria to generate ATP, and uh -huh. um, and so. We, we, we didn't see differences in our cadence, but that doesn't mean that the force generation between those different volumes and the stroke wasn't, it wasn't different. In fact, and our data would suggest it was different. The force was different with each stroke because of the fact that the oxygen consumption was significantly different. But I'll let Jeff also add some of that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's part of the equation. I think cadence is part of the energy equation, but I think it, there, there are just many other variables. Um, I think that study that we did on volume shows that energy use can vary independent of cadence. So cadence right. stay the same, but energy use can vary independence of, uh, of cadence. And so I was trying to think of a good analogy. I, I studied gait as well, walking. Uh -huh. And I think the gait cycle is somewhat analogous to the paddling stroke. And so I was trying to think of if I, if I put someone on a treadmill and have them walk and let's say I compare two different styles of shoes and I have them walk for a while, if they take fewer strides over like a one minute period, I'm probably not going to assume that one pair of shoes was more efficient than the other, but it, it does indicate there's something different. So something's different about this. Um, where the walking analogy falls apart is that we're all really good at walking because we do it a lot. We're <laughs> very few people are really good at paddling. And so I think when you put a different pair of shoes on someone, they will pretty quickly settle into a gait that is most energy efficient for them. And so that may involve changing how many strides they take. Whereas, uh, if you're paddling a surfboard, I just don't know. I don't know if this person is really good at paddling and 
are they settling into the most energy efficient way to paddle or are they using some other variable that they're optimizing? Or maybe they just don't really know this board is too new and they're just still trying to figure that out. Um, or maybe they're worried that their paddling coach is watching them and they better, <laughs> they better have the, the perfect technique. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. I do think it's part of the equation. I don't know that um, it's necessarily kind of the, the end all be all of efficiency. And, and I guess there, there's just a lot of variables behind it that could be changing. And so the, the output may not change, but something else might be changing kind of in the background. Right. I, I just yeah, think that's... that this leads us to you guys having to do this study with your VO2 and your heart rate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very simple study for us to do um, since we've done them so often now. Um, it just, it's, it's cookbook for us now to do the, to throw three different boards, right? If I'm three different doing, boards, same volume. You could even use yeah. the same boards for the Zuhair. He even I, said, I'll I, bring can, them I down. can send them down. Yeah. I'll send yeah, them down. I mean, that, it's, it's, I mean, we just have to find the students to do it right now. That's, that's the only, it would be the only issue. But yeah, it's, it's pretty cookbook for us to do now because we've done it so much. We know, know the ins and outs of how to do it. But yeah, I mean, that to really look at efficiency, you have to look at metabolic energy expenditure. Um, and, and that's the gold standard. And, and yeah, we have the ability to do that. So yeah, we, we would love to help you guys out in any way we can, for sure. Sweet. Yeah. You guys have to write it up, but we don't want to write it up. <laughs> we have too many papers to write up already. You get the data, we'll write it up. I'll bring the there boards you. down too. There you go. Sounds good. I'm sure Paris, I mean, that's a good problem to have, right? Too many papers to write up. That's right. Yeah. Well, and they, you know, they even have the same problem we had was finding participants but they really? have undergrads as well. So they have like, a little don't bit. Don't you larger. have like many willing undergrads? You can't pass that's, this course if you don't paddle. <laughs> no, so that's what well, we, we can't force our, our students to be subjects. And, but that's that's a great thing about the paradigm we have set up at CSU San Marcos. Uh, when I used to teach and I wasn't part of chair, it was a great paradigm. I remember now, now that I'm part of chair, but Jeff is still able to utilize this paradigm. And the paradigm is this, is we have a curriculum that has laboratory-based classes and those laboratory-based classes um, have five weeks of, of standard labs that those labs all, that those courses always have, no matter what university you're at. But the last ten weeks of the course are really focused on students doing a focused research study with the mentorship of a graduate student or the professor. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, a, it's the graduate student because it's a graduate student's master's thesis. And then what we get is, you know, um, seven to ten undergraduates with every graduate student, helping that graduate student re go to the beach, recruit subjects, bring subjects in that are also surfers. So it expands our ability to recruit subjects and bring them into campus. We don't, I mean, there's been a few studies that we have provided incentives for our subjects. So maybe some swag that uh, industry has given us, but you know, we, we've probably tested, we had a calculation a long time ago, but Tens of thousands of subjects have gone through our protocols. We have a tremendous amount of data. In fact, we should probably just start doing something, putting all the data together on some of the variables we have. But um, tens of thousands of subjects have gone through. We're not giving them any real incentives, but yet they're still volunteering to do it, which is fantastic because they really have bought into that surfing's cool and they would love to do something that would help, you know, help surfing out to maybe increase somebody's warmth in their surfing or increase their performance. So I, I, it's amazing that we were able to get this many subjects without paying them. I'm, I'm shocked that we've been able to do it. And I, I thank the San Diego surf community for their willingness to participate in our studies. And, and also Northern California in the most recent study. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. I mean, that was literally our biggest challenge we found was to actually get people, get people to participate. Yeah. 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 It, it helps if you have some incentive, but um, it, it also is really a lot easier if you have students that have friends that surf and can kind of go out and right. Them. right, right. Yeah. The problem is we always have to, whoever somebody brings in, right, we have to make sure that they meet some standard of, of surfing that we would, they're not beginners. So we ask them, there's questionnaires they fill out to make sure. And then we, if they're doing a flume-based study, we always have a pre-study to see how they can paddle and everything. And 
it becomes very odd. And Rob can obviously attest this. It becomes very apparent when somebody doesn't doesn't surf that often because they can't paddle on a plume. Yeah. Um, in fact, people start losing boards and plumes, which I've seen boards flying out of the back of the plume before. So. <laughs> It's pretty funny. So uh, what kind of future plans do you guys have? You guys said you're wrapping up a lot of the studies that you've been conducting. When is the next cycle of surf studies come? Does it kind of go in a cycle or how does that all work? I feel like the last eight years, we've been pretty redlined, to tell you the truth. We've, we've been nonstop always when we're not even finishing studies. Like we have three or four going at a time and then, before they're even finished, we get three or four more going. Um, this is kind of a unique phase in our in our careers. I think it had something to do with COVID. Um, we haven't really transitioned to a lot, but Jeff Jeff has some things that he's on, he's thinking about doing. And, and I have a, I have a few things I'm also thinking on the thermal regulation side of of, of doing. We we don't really want to share those if that's okay. No, because no, no. there could be people in academia listening to us. We would hate to have some of our colleagues across the, the world maybe scooping us on those projects. <laughs> no specifics needed. No, I'm just but yes, thermal it. regulation for sure. And I know Jeff is interested in doing some paddling, paddling uh, studies. So that'll make you happy, Rob. Yeah, I'm stoked. And board, may, any, any court kind of board stuff and acceleration and sprinting, I'm all about that. Um, and even the wetsuit stuff, because people come to me and they're like, oh yeah, this wetsuit restricts my motion. I'm like, well, let's, let's go, let's check out the data on that, you know? Yeah. And it's just the easiest way for me as a practitioner, it's the easiest way to not necessarily to put somebody down on what they think, because, you know, even professionals that come to me, they're like, this is how I was taught. And I was like, that's their basis of knowledge is that it's been passed down from one of the next. And they think that that's science, but it's, nothing's been tested. And so it's the easiest for me to say, oh, well, the science says this. I don't know, honestly, but this is what the science says. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's a good out for a coach to have. It's interesting you say that because I've had people in industry tell me, I don't, I don't need science. I've surfed, for thir- I've surfed for 40 years. I know exactly how it works. And I laughed at them like, I've surfed for 45 years and I still haven't figured out how it works. <laughs> like, how, how exactly do you know how it works? And I don't, oh I surf for more years. Um, well, I, I always, and I told Z- Zuhair this last time I said, I always bring up when I hear that, I always bring up what my wife says. She says, yeah, you've been surfing for 40 years. Well, how much better could you have been? <laughs> You're still floundering around out there, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think too, as we start doing, as we start getting back into it and you guys, I'm sure saw this with your experiment, you do one experiment and you instantly have like a hundred new questions, right? 100%. So it, uh, that's kind of the way it works. We've been kind of laying low for a couple of years. And now as we start doing these experiments again, there's going to be a, a bunch of new questions that pop up. Great. So um, yeah. And, and one other area I've been interested in that we haven't mentioned is just looking at balance. Yeah. Um, balance in surfers is kind of unique. It's not we, we can't really assess it the way we assess balance in like older adults or, you know, kind of the like concussion protocol, stuff like that, because those are, are much more static. And so I think the, the kind of balance that surfers develop is much more dynamic, you know, much more um, in response to a, a really unstable environment. And so trying to figure out ways to reproduce that in the lab. I've been working on this for years. <laughs> I've got a uh, mechanical surfboard that we're going to try to use to, to perturb surfers and look at their responses and see, um, you know, what, what differences there are among surfers and non-surfers and what kind of develops with practice. That's awesome. That does sound exciting. Yeah. Cool guys. Well, thanks. Thanks for your time. I'll, uh, I'll see you guys in like a month, I think. Yeah. It's you're coming down pretty soon here. So we'll yeah. be happy to catch up with you and, I'll bring you Zohair's board. What's that? I'll bring Zohair's boards. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to call and you guys out on, on you guys wanting to do that. So we're going to make yeah. you do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and for any of the people that are watching this, if they, they want any information, we have, I think, over, I think we're close to 30 publications in this area now. Um, over the last eight years we've done. So if you have any interest in, in what we're doing, just shoot us an email at our academic addresses or email addresses and we'll, we can 
provided in the PDFs, just like we provided you, Rob, the other day in some, some of our studies. So, yeah, in the interest you have to reading those, just let us know and we'll, we'll shoot it to you. We always like talking to people about it, but we're not we're not trying to sell anything here. We're just just doing research. Nice. And I'll and I'll put that stuff. Uh, if you have a link, do you have a link to where it all exists, like a library, or does it have to go through your email? We had a web. We have a website, but it's not very well maintained. Jeff doesn't do a very good job maintaining. So. <laughs> Call them out. It's been updated. <laughs> it's been a little bit updated. Or or that's guys, just to reach out to us and we can, yeah. we can always just shoot you. We're always good about shooting people PDFs. Cool. So yeah, as long as uh, you guys don't mind me sharing your email, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. no problems. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And I'll see you, uh, see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Nice talking to you guys. All right. Thanks, see you guys. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye.